50% over the next three decades. To mitigate climate risk in the agriculture sectors, we must scale adoption of technologies that help improve yields and to achieve production with right food quality and minimal use of resources. Given this background, CII has curated sessions which will deep dive into global advancements on technology by providing an opportunity to listen to global solution providers about their technology and explore opportunities for their adoption with respect to climate change in India. This is our first thematic session of the second day on carbon smart farming. Agriculture can significantly decrease humanity's carbon footprint and leverage soil as an efficient carbon sink can play this pivotal role in our fight against climate change. This session will focus on the complete landscape of carbon smart farming, including GHG calculators, validation tools, marketplaces for carbon credits, as well as tools for advisory at the farm level. We have an illustrious panel of innovators with us today, and to chair this session, we have with us Mr. Rajesh Srivastav, member CII core group on AgTech, and executive chairman Rabo Equity, and chairman Travis Advisors India. Mr. Srivastava has been into corporate finance and investment banking for over 43 years and has worked across Indian and international banks in India and abroad. He is one of the founding members of Rabo Bank in India. Mr. Srivastava has been an active advisor to the Government of India with respect to food and agriculture businesses. He has been consulting with the Ministry of Food Processing Government of India and played a key role in building Vision 2015 document with the Ministry in 2005. In addition, he earlier advised MarkPed, NDTV, Mother Dairy and several state governments on their strategies for the sector. Over to you, Mr. Srivastava, for taking this session forward. Thank you, Rituja. Thank you very much. And um, a very warm welcome to uh, all my fellow speakers as well as all the audience participants. Uh, I think this is a very, very interesting topic uh, for many of us. And I must confess, including myself, I think many of us are not fully really ingrained into this subject, <clears throat> which actually speaking is a relatively a newer concept for Indian agriculture. Uh, so before uh, we go into, I think, um, uh, just as it was just said, I've been with the Rubber Bank 25 years, so my DNA has also changed. I'm essentially a food and agri person. I would not know much about anything else except this. Uh, and now we have recently founded a new platform called Province Advisors, which is dealing again in food, agri and sustainability. So thank you, CII, for inviting me and to also chair this session. Uh, I think with such illustrious co-panelists, it's not an easy task, but at the same time, I'll try to do justice as much as possible. Um, firstly, uh, I think it'll do some good to all the participants if I were to simplistically talk a little bit about carbon farming. So what is carbon farming? I think it's a whole farm approach to optimizing carbon capture on working landscapes by implementing practices that are known to improve the rate at which CO2 is removed from the atmosphere and stored in plant material and or soil organic matter. That's a, uh, that's a Google-based definition, which I must uh, share with you. I think many uh, times, uh, lots of things come up, regenerative agriculture, which I think is synonymous with carbon farming. And uh, otherwise, you know, the things like saying that, uh, uh, you know, carbon reorganization, carbon is an energy currency, and all that is necessary for receiving, storing, and releasing in, on farms. And But more importantly, I think it's very important to understand that carbon farming is successful when carbon gains resulting from, from better and enhanced land management and or conservation practices exceed carbon losses. And that's where I think the catch is. Um, so also the terminologies like sequestration of carbon, reducing greenhouse gases, uh, all of that, I think, is very, very key. And if we go a little bit further up and talk in terms of more like the net zero ambitions of all the countries, the COP26 declarations of COP27 meeting recently held in, in Paris, and also, of course, India's commitment to be a net zero country uh, by 2070, which our Honorable Prime Minister announced. Uh, I think that's, that's really speaking a tall order when we speak talk about Indian agriculture, which I think is many notches still behind. It has to, a lot of catch up to do with Europe, US and other developed countries. So having said this, uh, 
not forgetting for a moment that uh, the agri side of the picture is about 20-25% uh, responsible for all the emissions and equally then obliged to arrest them. I think it's important that we focus on the agriculture side or the farming side uh, to know that what best we can do to contribute to this net zero target of the world and of course India. Um, when we talk about carbon smart farming, which is the topic, which is the theme of the day, then obviously one has to talk about the smart basis on which the farming should be done or carbon should be sequestered or removed or, or, or reduced. And then that's where the precision agriculture, the technology aspects of that all comes into play. Uh, as I was reading through the, uh, the uh, bios of all my fellow panelists, I found that obviously all of you, everybody has done so much of work on carbon that the measurement tools, uh, the, all the practices, which of course we have to still learn in India, it's got to come by. And it would be great to hear from them what all happens. But on India, I must also say that uh, we have a lot of um, catch up to do, as I said. I think there is a concept globally, and we have to follow that, is the just transition concept. That when you talk about all this reduction and net zero targets, then the growth also has to be fair and equal. And we have to ensure that the poor do not lose out in the bargain. So uh, solutions, in India could be in, in many actually, uh, the mobility solutions, uh, the industrial green hydrogen, uh, which is the latest one being talked about. And then the, of course, the smart carbon farming. I was reading through and I found that there's been a very, very interesting, a homegrown solution, so to say, in a, in a town in, in, or a village in Kerala actually called Minangari, where they have tree banking successfully laid out where I think the local government, uh, panchayat and all, they have been absolutely alive to the situation. And they, what they've done is they have mitigated the, the costs of the farmers just to ensure that the trees are grown and not felled before time. And that's, I think, doing quite well. But the reason I mentioned this is that, you know, in a country like India, you also have to have very customized and tailor-made solutions which can suit the population, uh, the the all the uh, I would say the income classes and the kind of disaggregated farm practices we have. So uh, I think what we have to do is what I say is the EIM and the education, then implementation and then monetization. I think this is the step or steps to be followed. Really speaking, to ensure that carbon is not only sequestered and re and and removed from the atmosphere but also it is monetized properly by the farmers. Uh, so let me not uh, stand now too much between the steamed panel and, and, the, and uh, you know, all the deliberations. Uh, but before I uh, revert to all my uh, foreign-based uh, 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 panelists here, and that's indeed a very one of those unique panels I'm, I'm chairing really well. Every speaker is really speaking from some, some country or the other. That's interesting. Um, but before that, I, I have the privilege uh, of uh, having somebody very, very important uh, with us, which is Mr. Rajiv Chawla. He's a 1987 batch IS officer and currently designated as Chief Knowledge Officer and Advisor in the Ministry of, of Agriculture and Farmers Welfare. Uh, he comes from Karnataka, where he really caused a, a revolution when he initiated a, a project called Project Bhumi, where the land records uh, were digitalized and I think is doing pretty well. Um, if I'm not mistaken, Mr. Chavla, you also try to do that on the urban areas. I, I don't know what happened. Yes, I sir. think, uh, yeah, so I think that's, that's interesting. Uh, he also, uh, he's received, uh, and no wonder, the Prime Minister's Award for Excellence in Civil Services in 2007 for this project, Bhumi. Uh, he has an he is an engineer of 2007 batch from IIT Kanpur, uh, which also conferred upon him the Distinguished Alumnus Award for its significant contributions. Uh, what I also read up, Mr. Chawla, and that's something which is very interesting, is that he likes to call himself as an as an IS engineer, and not an IS officer. So thank you very much for switching the sessions and coming into this this session, which is the privilege for all of us. And I'm really very very eager and curious to hear your views on the subject. 
Mr. Chandler, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Can somebody show the slides, please? We're just pulling them up. Yeah. Uh, so, dear colleagues and friends, uh, I'm going to speak about a data-driven project which the government of India has taken up for the whole nation. And I thought that this perhaps would let all others, panelists and others who are listening, know as to what is happening on open data as far as agriculture is concerned. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Now, uh, the AgriStack project is for uh, providing digital services to the farmers. Uh, it's for facilitating the delivery of services by government and, of course, by private sector, agri tax, et cetera. Under the project, you create various databases or registries, as they are now called, create policies on data sharing, et cetera. Uh, create the IT systems to deliver services by the state and the central government, and of course, regulator. Because once you have such data, you need to have a regulator in place. Next slide. You have all heard about Aadhaar, uh, which has about uh, uh, the whole country covered, uh, 150 crores, 1,500 million people. As against that, which is, which is just a database of all the citizens, Rather, residents, every stack would have a database of all the farmers, and we have about 150 million farmers, and therefore impacting the life of about 750 million people, considering a family size of five. Uh, each farmer gets a farmer ID, and then of course, uh, you would have the all the land holdings of that farmer into the database along with the coordinates of each land of the farmer. And I must tell you that in this country, the land holding is very small. It is of the, uh, approximately about uh, 1.5 to 2 hectares. So you'll have GPS coordinates of each land. The crops grown during each season, and we have three seasons in the country. And then, of course, the benefits availed by the farmers from the government. You will have a UFSI, Unified Farmer Service Interface layer, through which you can access this data. Because the data would go to everybody, including private sector, you will need regulations to control the use of this data, and perhaps would also have, therefore, a regulator. Next slide, please. To depict this uh, easily, uh, you can see this is the way a uh, typical Every stack would look like for each farmer, you will have its details, including each of the land parcel with the land ID. And then, of course, uh, I must tell you that there are approximately, approximately 800 million land IDs in the country. So you will have each of that land ID shown against the farmer, along with the geo coordinates of each of the plots. You will have crop details shown against each of the farmers, each of the plot, and then, of course, the soil health. That means what is the health of the NPK and other micro materials. So that would be the type of a data on the top of which you can then put use cases. Next slide, please. Now, what is the Government of India doing? The Government of India is now building the framework and guidelines for every step building three core databases, as I explained, the farmer database, the location of each plot, and the, what is the crop grown during each season. I also spoke about the uh, layer, the UFSI layer through which the data would be picked up. You will have a consent manager because you would be sharing the personal data of the farmers, and therefore, this consent manager would ensure that uh, you share the data only after the farmers have given the consent. You'll also have the data standardization layer so that the taxonomy, the standards, the way data is understood in different states. When we have approximately 35 states, 
and each of the state has a way of maintaining land record. And then, of course, you will have a large number of state government and central government IT application uh, to make use of it. There would be a sandbox, a data exchange, and portals. And I would explain a little more about and about data exchange because today I was asked to speak about the data sharing policies and how data sharing would make the system better, would make the economy better for farmers and for others. Next slide, please. These are the, apart from these four registries, there would be many other registries like the master list of the crop, the seeds, the fertilizers, pesticides, bank service providers etc so a large number of registries uh, which would be put in place next slide now there would of course be regulations which would be put in place because this data would be used by private sector to build solutions farmers would be able to pick up any uh, service provider and things can go wrong the services may harm the farmer the companies may charge higher money, they may misuse the farmer's data, and therefore you will have regulations in this new sector coming up. Next slide, please. Now, data is the core to the agri stack value proposition. And in next about eight, nine minutes, I intend talking about this. To enable, uh, now the whole idea is that you enable farmers to realize higher income and profits using the agri stack system and enhance also the efficiency which you would get because these there would be r d innovations on the top of the data and of course private services would be provided next slide now there would be government to business sharing of data and of course you will also have a mandatory now this is a new thing eu is doing it in health sector and we are thinking of doing a similar thing in the case of uh, agri stack agriculture that we would say that look if we if you have to take data from us and use it there's a large amount of data with various ministries with various governments and there's a large repository of data with various ministries so once we give you data we also expect that you also provide this data back to other uh, private sector and also provide the data back to the government so that government can gain from those innovations and the other other private sectors may also gain from the from the data next slide now uh, once you have data the discoverability and accessibility would also become easy uh, these are the foundation requirements for machine learning and we expect that while you use data today to use to provide services like price information the future would of course be in the innovation the way these data would be used uh, to do many things for example carbon sequencing you were talking about or even the organic cultivation how to maximize organic cultivation what the machine learning with the help of data would lead to all those advantages. And we expect that data innovation is predicated for any B2B and B2B data sharing. That only when you have this data that the innovation happens. The non-personal data and the raw data would help to innovate new ideas. The IoT devices, which would bring huge amount of data, would also be another factor which would lead to sharing this data among other businesses and there, thereafter you have a common good of the country achieved next slide please now the how do you really share this data so we intend to bring what is called agri data exchange a common infrastructure using which not only government to business but even business to government and business to business data sharing could be done uh, the system would be simple and efficient there would be enough safeguards so that you don't the private sector does not misuse the data and and that there is a fair and equitable data access 
so you you ensure access to everybody access to every company and of course preserving public interest would be very very important and the data should not be mis- misused by anybody and of the idea should be to maximize benefits for everybody now uh, regulating data sharing arrangements would therefore be a key to success we would also have to ensure that there is some data stewardship for farmers as farmers many farmers may not really understand as whether they giving their consent to the data is really useful or dangerous for them next slide please so we have some principles and i thought that uh, people would be interested in knowing that uh, we the regulator would be a independent regulator and we would be largely getting you know we would be learning from the eu's proposed common health data space and indicative saying that look our data registry metadata of all data would be put in place and and therefore we would ensure that while you you can use the data there would be there would be obligation on one who are who are taking data they should not use the data for the purpose for which they have not got the approval and they of course they would tell us why they need to use this data and what are the other sources apart from the data they are getting the other sources which they would use they should also tell us whether they would join personal data and non personal data or some other data to to kind of produce some output so sometime it can happen that when you use multiple data sources uh, you you tend to be destructive sometimes it would equity would not be put in place sometimes the national interest the public interest may also get vitiated next slide please now uh, we would our job the regulator's job would be that he evaluates the data request he gives the permit and once he gives the permit then of course you get the data through the agri exchange whether it is from one business partner to another business partner or from government to business partner the friend principle supplied you have a purpose limitation storage limitation and time limitation we the regulator would be able to do the audit of the data impose penalty on defaulter and also uh, on the other side uh, instituting standards for data quality and differential pricing even based on type of data seeker so if you have a r&d organization you perhaps charge less amount from those people next slide please the g2b that is from government to business sharing of non personal data in the agriculture domain would mean that not big tech companies and big agri players corner the whole data it would have to be ensured that the domestic agri tech service companies below a particular revenue threshold would would should should be given a preferred access so that they come up we would have conditionalities to ensure that the non personal data is not combined with other data sets in the market for predatory profiling and targeting of the farmer now we have to be careful in the farming sector you have large number of farmers and this predatory profiling and targeting would have to be avoided we would do public consultation by the regulator so that the farmers and farmers groups are taken into confidence and of course there may be also be a possibility of compulsory public licensing of digital products created by using this open government data next slide please and i have two more slides uh, on the business to business sharing of non personal data we would incentivize vol- voluntary data sharing and if you take data if one of the business sector request another business sector data normally the other business sector shall not deny if he is requested by the regulator of course things like trade secrets and some other uh, innovation details which are there can be removed but otherwise there should be no reason for somebody not to share the data next slide 
the b2g sharing of non personal data in the agriculture domain would be the job of regulator mandatory data sharing obligations would be put on the private players and they they shall share the data in the public interest next slide and i finally come to the data stewardship uh, when you share data and especially the personal data by the farmer they would perhaps not understand when to share the data and when not and therefore you will have stewardship the farmer producer organization and you will have trusteeship model where on behalf of farmer somebody else some people in whom they can confide they they can be used they can they can check whether such data needs to be shared by the farmers or not and this way we think that in coming year the agri stack would open up a system where the data availability would lead to the maximizing of public interest especially in the agriculture sector thanks a lot thank you so much thank you mr chawla i think it is very interesting uh, hearing this and such a lot of constructive work going on and clearly there has been a lot of granular thinking in this so i do hope that this all comes into being um uh, you know as as a as a banker and agri site of the banking um i do find that one of the astounding blocks has been non existence of truly speaking the registries of land records huh? because the banks do not manage to get the mortgages done and and liens done on those land holdings and that's been a problem of by of farmers uh, in getting the credit so i'm sure that it's going to solve that side of the issue as well uh i think one other thing which i learned saw in this is very interesting is that the self uh, proclaimed trusteeships so i think fpos are the right bodies indeed if they can become some kind of local monitoring or or trustee kind of an organization i think that will help because you need to go down deep down and bottom the pyramid i think today probably the best possible organization is fpo so i think clearly some work to be done but a lot has been done so thank you very much again for being with us and uh, thank i you. hope i do hope that you will stay on till the end of the session so that yes, you, know, yes, you can be. you can hear the other speakers as well um let let me now turn to uh, uh, philip philip mulvey who is the chief executive officer of carbon count australia uh, and carbon count is a project management platform that streamlines the entire process of running a soil carbon project into a clear and simple workflow uh it produces all regulator required documentation in a format that's ready for submission enabling growers to track and manage multiple soil carbon projects with ease uh philip is a specialist in soil and water chemistry with over 25 years experience in soil sciences hyd hydrogeology water resource assessment contamination studies geological mapping and and aquifer modeling uh what is not here which i saw that and i mentioned to philip the other day you also do sailing so that's that's wonderful uh over to you i did glance through the handbook which you have on from carbon counts the on farm carbon management very interesting handbook but uh, it applies to australia i do hope that you will soon have an indian version of this handbook so over to you philip thank you thank you for the introduction um and thank you to CII and the conference sponsors um for sponsoring this session and for inviting me and for all the attendees for for attending um as you just alluded to that <clears throat> I come from Australia I enjoyed the T20 recently which was a exciting uh opportunity of cricket particularly the the semi final match in, involving India um and you have raised the fact that in australia the um carbon farming methodologies available there's about 18 of them of which soil carbon is one and it picks up a whole diversity of natural solutions but at the moment soil carbon is and uh, ecoforestry on on land is amongst the growing ones that are occur um i'd like to pick up quite a bit um on uh, mr shala's uh, presentation and it was fascinating to hear 
um, having been to India um, for a, a scientific conference and trip that we were organising um, together with, with Terry, uh, an eminent organisation with, uh, within India, that um, when handling data, there's a couple of really important things to consider, and this is aspects in regard to what we offer within our platform is carbon's a commodity, and it's one of the few commodities that doesn't leave um, the land or the mine. So it's traded um, very importantly by data, and it's traded um, by having a clear understanding of what the measurement is about. So whether you're measuring trees or whether you're measuring uh, carbon in soil and it's improvement that it gives to the, the community, um, the climates and the farm itself, um, you actually have to be very cognizant of measurement. So that's what our um, technology, our software platform focuses very heavily is not just on modeling, but actual how to bring measurement cheaply and efficiently to farm. Because every commodity traded in the world, be it from agriculture or mining, is traded on measurement and two particular measurements that occur. One is quality and one is quantity. Um, and so it's very important that that be estimated accurately and cheaply as possible to, over, to allow the trade to occur. So you have to understand the error functions associated with it. So that's what our platform operates on. We've evolved from a circumstance of a research project of, from three PhDs, which we supported 15 years ago, to look at a new type of geostatistics that can be applied equally to the FUs, um, the cooperative farming situations, as it can to um, commercial farms. And the idea was to be able to bring to market the highest integrity carbon um, and the most carbon at the lowest possible measured cost. Um, so this new type of uh, geostatistics um, was at an involving field of the day, which was called unequal area stratification of which we use a lot of modeling to actually come up with the optimized number of strata and sample to achieve that. So it's focused on trading carbon, it's focused on what the error the market wants and how to achieve the lowest error. So how do you apply it um, right down to, to small farms and um, what is the benefit that it offers? So the beauty, about carbon and being a soil scientist is the carbon in the soil actually allows you to hold more moisture, hold more nutrients, increase climate resilience, reduce the cost of sales so you're in increasing profit for the farm. And also when I say in in uh, decreasing cost of sales, I should say, also by doing that, you're actually reducing acid fertilizers that are being applied. So all those benefits are massive for the environment, eutrophication and so forth. So our focus is very much in delivering a system that is able to improve farm and farm communities. Um, and we do that by this platform, it's based on science and delivering new statistics and working with um, known aspects in both India and Australia on how to sequester carbon. Um, so that's the program that we provide. Um, it's different to most of the rest of the world for a couple of reasons. One is Australia is a big emitter, everyone knows that. And the reason we're a big emitter is we export coal and gas. And so it's pretty hard for us to cut back on all that. So we've had 15 years as a country focusing on how to look at offsets and how to create reliable, low-cost offsets that have a low error associated with them. So there is lots of methods in Australia. Some have application to India. Having been to India, I can see that they do, and some don't. Australia, like India, is both an old country and also a unique country, and you've got a few more people than we have. So those sort of systems um, do result in a different approach. So thank you very much for the invitation. Um, the whole field's quite new and still evolving, and, and it's a delight um, to have heard the presentation on where India's at, and we'd be happy sometime in the future to continue an involvement as we have in the past in India. So thank you. Thank you, Philip. Thanks very much. And uh, absolutely very clear. And I think uh, we just certainly need you in India. 
uh, you know, many times actually speaking, um, and just to ensure that all this gets into a movement and experts like yourselves have to be involved. Otherwise, it will take much longer for us to evolve ourselves. So please be with us as much as you can. Uh, let me uh, now turn to uh, uh, Ms. Devon Long, who is the General Manager of Australia and New Zealand of Regrow, uh, which is a U.S. company. Uh, this is Regrow Ag is the leading technology platform that empowers food and agriculture companies to achieve net zero carbon goals within their supply chains. Uh, Regrow's science and technology allows growers to make field level practice changes, uh, track progress in real time and earn revenue for their efforts. Uh, as uh, the catchphrase goes, there is at Regrow, we power the business case for sustainable agriculture. Devon herself is a technologist and specialized in applying technology to enable and incentivize sustainable food production. So, uh, Devon, uh, please uh, come on now. Thanks so much, Rajesh, and thank you for the whole team um, for giving me the opportunity to speak briefly today about what Regrow does. Uh, so like many of the organizations attending and the panelists here today, Regrow is trying to solve the climate crisis, specifically focused on agriculture as unfortunately a significant contributor to that overall uh, global climate crisis. Similar to Philip, who is definitely speaking my language, <laughs> uh, the great news is that, you know, we really believe that the solution is, is quite literally and has been for a while under our feet through soil and regenerative um, farming that has the power to, you know, not only sequester carbon, I know that gets a lot of the headlines, but also reduce farming inputs, conserve water, enhance crop resilience, and uh, really do a lot for our kind of food production in general. So this kind of underutilized tool in, in soil is, is particularly important, at least in, in our business, in the context of reducing scope three emissions for our food, beverage, and textile supply chains. So um, for those who aren't familiar, scope three emissions is the emissions that are indirectly attributable to a product because they occurred either upstream or downstream of the final product. Um, so if I'm a t-shirt producer, all the emissions that were created on the cotton farm for the cotton that went into my t-shirt are my scope three emissions. Now, these are a hot topic because you'll see that all of the big food brands, you know, not only they they set targets to, to reduce scope three, but the important thing to note is that these are the emissions that are the least within their control to actually address and, and do something about, which is which is really remarkable. Um, additionally, you know, scope three emissions are on average 11.4 times higher than operational emissions. Um, and particularly for food, beverage and textile, that's mostly on farm. So the, the reality is that no matter whether you're in India or Australia or South America or the US, for food production to transition to net zero, working on farm to implement more regenerative practices, while 100% is, is difficult, is uh, essential to, to move the needle. So this really kind of begs an obvious question, which is, you know, why hasn't this already happened? If we have all these great practices like, you know, tillage changes and cover cropping and, you know, adjustments to nutrient management, and they're all adoptable and known about and, you know, there's no kind of high tech stuff going on here. Why haven't we done it, right? Why isn't this ubiquitous um, across the globe? And I think at Regrow, you know, put simply, we believe that adopting climate smart practices requires time, money and effort from growers um, and receiving appropriate payment for these efforts is, is really complicated. Uh, and Regrow, and particularly our, our software offerings, exists to solve this problem by providing robust validation of carbon outcomes on farm. So um, our software is uh, specifically our measurement reporting and verification software, typically known as MRV for short, um, and the underlying technologies behind it. This is the backbone that kind of props up credible, robust and verifiable outcomes for these projects. And additionally, and this is important, it does this at scale. So it does this without the need for boots on the ground, no spot checks, no sampling, no you know tedious documentation and surveys with farmers. Um, so if, if you're willing and able to support and reward farmers for adoption, which is no small feat, our platform can measure, monitor and report on, on those outcomes with the goal of supporting a, a financial transaction on the back of them. Um, some of those kind of underpinning technologies that support our MRV 
On one hand is our environmental modeling assets. So um, the big one being uh, DNDC. Um, these enable us to accurately kind of predict the emissions and soil organic carbon impacts of an on-farm practice, no matter where in the world you are. Um, and then the second is our remote sensing capabilities. So as uh, many scientists here will know, the downfall of a model is that if you put rubbish into the model, uh, you get rubbish out. So our remote sensing enables us to make sure that those practice changes are actually happening out there in the real world. Um, so together, these technologies have, have really made Regrow uh, a, a, a very innovative platform for powering carbon projects on farm, where that focus is, is kind of that verifiable change. And, um, you know, we are being leveraged uh, at scale in both the insetting markets, so working with big brands to reduce scope three within their supply chains, as well as in the offsetting market where we have projects registered on, on some of the, the big registries. So, uh, you know, the Clean Energy Regulator, American Carbon Registry, Vera, Sustain, so stuff like that. So that's a little bit about regrow. <laughs> uh, in terms of, you know, I think the, the really interesting topic today, which is, you know, how does that apply to the Indian market? You know, I think for us, what's really exciting is just the fact that India is such an agricultural powerhouse. So particularly in the cropping sector, talking, you know, rice, wheat, cotton, sugarcane, there are incredible opportunities for reduction if you have that right incentive structure in place. Um, and, you know, to be honest, as a global platform with a universal model, you know, for any areas where there's been previous data collection, we can be ready to support the Indian market pretty much on demand. Technology adaptation is not the issue. The key challenge, and I'm sure the other panelists will agree with this, is that kind of market aggregation. So having um, larger players in the supply chain who can operate on behalf of a number of farmers. You know, I'm from Australia. Um, you know, I, I, I was born and raised here. We have this problem and our farms are enormous. <laughs> so coming to India where the supply chain is very disintermediated, you know, that problem is, is you know, uh, significantly uh, more prominent. So I think in terms of, you know, what I would encourage is those aggregators in those supply chain, either the, the buyers, the exporters, the co-ops, um, you know, really I would look at what the options are to create extra value. And maybe that's, um, you know, looking at downstream buyers, you know, many of the kind of US, uh, US based brands we work with that have set scope three are actively relying on their global supply chain partners to, to come to them with opportunities. Um, but even looking, you know, beyond that, the offset market is becoming more viable every day. Um, and, you know, it was really interesting to hear Rajesh talk about the kind of NDC commitment um, that the government of India has made. I always use kind of Vietnam as a, as a really interesting use case of a government that has mobilized around working with the agricultural sector to, to meet its NDC commitments. So maybe there's some exciting partnerships there over the next two or three years. So that's me. I'll, I'll hand back to you, Rajesh. Thank you, Devon. Thank you very much. I think I was going to ask you about India anyway and ask all the panelists, but I'll do that later. Let this round uh, happen. And uh, so, so I'm 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 uh, almost done with people in Australia now. Let's move away from the region and uh, let's get uh, Dr. Geza Todd, who's the head of EMEA and APAC Business Unit of Carbon Space uh, Ireland. Um, and Carbon Space provides a satellite powered platform for carbon footprint tracking. Tracking. And uh, Dr. Geza has about 20 years of experience with climate policy and implementation in applied science and corporate settings. He has developed various carbon methodologies and innovation projects. As a head of certifications and EMEA APAC region at Carbon Space, he's committed to bring cutting edge technology and validated primary data into land based carbon accounting. So you can see that I'm moving in a little bit of a sequence, actually. I'm, I'm, I've, I've jettisoned the set uh, sequence. So I'm, I'm going deliberately. And so I'll, I'll come to the where the money lies, which is Ms. Golnara Aigoe later on. So let's, let's first of all get done with Dr. Geza Todd. So let's let you lead us on to the money. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for having me here today and um, having the opportunity to talk to you and, and reach broader audience in India. And it, thank you for the introduction. Indeed, on a personal note, I have a background in, in farming myself, but also I'm a, I'm a climate change scientist and I came from a 15 years of a chocolate past 
I've been working with the chocolate industry, and that ties me to India actually on various uh, channels as we were uh, co-creating the first water benefit standard, which, which came from India, supported also the Sustainable Sugarcane Initiative. And currently we are looking at um, the carbon space office in India. India um, has a very prominent place in space engineering and technology. So it is a very good ground for technical cutting edge companies of ours to find good base here. Now, a few words about uh, carbon space and um, I'm already building the, the bridge as you expected, uh, uh, Rajesh. Mm -hmm. uh, carbon space is a satellite powered uh, data company. Our data is um, basically very simple metric. It's called net ecosystem exchange. This is ecosystem level uh, carbon data generation. We basically can look at as little as a one hectare field where we have over 10 data points and uh, we can estimate with the multi multispectral satellite images linked with the uh, carbon flux stations and carbon uh, concentration measurement towers linking that in a good way together with artificial intelligence we can uh, calculate the actual carbon sequestration levels on any field this works in india on, on the full territory of india and basically what this entails that uh, above below ground uh, biomass and uh, other sequestration pools are taken into account, so also soil, to determine our net ecosystem exchange uh, metric. So net ecosystem exchange is um, a simple metric. You can apply it on agricultural fields, on the set-aside areas, carbon, uh, carbon uh, counting corridors. It is easy to scale because it's a fully remote-sensed approach. And... Um, it does provide primary data, but it does provide validated primary data. It's very important to note that we have a fully science-based approach. We have our own peer-reviewed publications in the space, and our reports come with a third-party verification. So how does this data, um, what are the use cases of this data, and um, how, uh, how does it apply for carbon farming payment, carbon, carbon smart agriculture? Um, such primary data can feed into carbon credit generation mandates, or it can be used um, to provide data to life cycle assessment. So replacing literature at value with the true carbon sequestration of fields is important. The technology makes it available today. But it can also be used to compare between large number of areas. We can detect the areas that are degrading and areas that are performing much better than others in carbon sequestration. And ultimately, by this, you can generate various claims. So the processors, manufacturers who buy raw materials from India are interested in the carbon footprint, and they are interested in reporting on this. There is a willingness to pay for this, but it needs to be linked with a validation, third-party verification approach, because eventually it will go into uh, corporate social responsibility reports. So ultimately, <clears throat> such technology can unlock carbon payments to farmers if applied correctly. But not only payments to farmers, it can unlock benefits across everyone for everyone across the value chain because the carbon footprint of the raw material, the carbon intensity of the raw material, it, it travels along uh, with the raw material until it ends up in a bar of chocolate and we eat it ourselves. So this is how we give visibility to the impact. And as I mentioned, this can be applied really in any kind of agricultural setting in India on smallholder farm levels. And it can be thousands or millions of smallholder farms uh, as long as uh, we can work on the quality uh, data registry. So working with shapefiles, working with clear land tenures. And here we are uh, partnering with the relevant uh, institutions as well we can bring forth these uh, validated, uh, verified claims that are uh, much looked after at the industry. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Giza. And I think uh, you really are a bridge. And I think we, and since you have an exposure to India, you mentioned that day and today as well. So I think uh, we would definitely like to host you with a box of chocolates next time you're here and uh, try to see that we really get something going on the ground. Because, you know, today, let's this be a, 
a very assuring discussion today, which should you know open up doors into real hard uh, projects, which we should take on board now. But before we start discussing a little bit of that, uh, let me turn to uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Ms. Gulnara Iguer, and I think she's the CEO and co-founder, founder of, sorry, Ormex Canada. Uh, Ormex is a climate tech, a digital voluntary marketplace of agricultural carbon credits. Ormex solution uh, enables farmers to diagnose the current level of carbon in soil and forecast the potential CO2 emissions that can be stored. Um, Ormex is recently funded by uh, Rothschild and BNP Paribas. So I think uh, good, very good names to uh, you know uh, talk about. Uh, but importantly, you know, the reason I came to you the last is because, you know, ultimately, you know, here what here is what we need to see happening: more of carbon credits from from farming, and also then the marketplace. How to get them monetized? I think do let us on to what can our farmers do to a uh, store them, sequester them, or remove them, get them measured, and finally, finally, where's the marketplace? Where's the market for monetizing them? So. Uh, Bilnara, stage is yours. Hello, Rajesh. Very glad to be here and thank you for your invitation. So, Ormix is based in Paris and France, not in Canada. <laughs> Just a small precision. Uh, but uh, so, yes, uh, we are working in voluntary carbon market space, and Ormex is a digital VCM, voluntary carbon marketplace and registry, uh, for carbon credits related to regenerative agriculture in particular. And before uh, even speaking about Ormex, I think it's very important to specify what is the flow uh, and the workflow and process for the farmers to get into uh, carbon credits and how can they sell them. So first of all, who are the sellers? Um, as Devon mentioned, this can be individual farmers, but also a group of farmers like cooperatives, for example. And this is very important because cooperatives can be what we call project developers for the registry of carbon credits. And um, these project, project developers can aggregate several farmers together and create one project for a particular space um, or community, for example, which is very interesting. It is very interesting from the buyer's perspective because buyers have a huge volumes demand on carbon credits offsetting. And that's why having bigger contracts on the market is, is, is really important. Um, so how it works, once the sellers would like to, to actually to be involved in this uh, in, in this carbon credits process. First of all, they need to know that it involves on their side also lots of changes in the practices that they are performing. So basically they will change the agricultural practices from traditional agricultural practices to regenerative ones. And what does that mean? Uh, typically we speak about no tilling, we speak about no monoculture, we speak about intercropping, we speak about cover crops and basically nourishing their, uh, the soils with organic matters to increase um, its health, to increase, increase the my, microorganisms inside the soil and store carbon in it. So it's um, it's really important that to know that this this change and uh, to obtain this carbon credits requires the change in agricultural practices. And um, once this is uh, this is done, it, they they need to register their project with one of their uh, certifications. So these can be international ones or domestic ones. Some of the countries have domestic certifications, as it is the case in France, for example, and you have international certifiers as a very well known uh, Vera Gold Standard or CDM, which covers around between 82 to 86 percent of the whole market globally. Um, so once this is uh, done and the registration is performed, then they can sell their carbon credits on the platforms as Ormex which have automated the whole process and in which they can be exposed to different buyers at the same time and get the best price of it. They can also obtain the price discovery as well from other participants, which is very important. I guess today on the market, it's a, it's it's very opaque to and, and not clear at which price farmers can, can do their selling. 
And it's important to have such a digital ecosystem and marketplace that can show them uh, which is the best price in their region, on their country and continent to sell their carbon credits. And this is also based on different, on different factors. Price difference is based on sectors. Uh, for example, if it is uh, regenerative agriculture or uh, energy, it will be a, a totally different price. Um, if it is, for example, a type of carbon credits, for example, if we're speaking about reduction, if we're speaking about avoidance, or we're speaking about removal and storage of carbon credits in the soil of carbon. So these are totally different pricing as well. Today, what we see is basically carbon removal is 50% um, more expensive than carbon reduction on the markets. Uh, so they need to know about that as well. And also about the geography. So carbon credits in Europe has a, a totally different price compared to Africa, US or Asia, for example. And in Europe, we see the most expensive carbon credits due to storage of carbon in the soil, basically around 38 on average uh, to 50 euros a ton uh, compared to Asia, which is around six to eight euros a ton. Sometimes this can raise to 16 euros a ton. Um, in America, we see it around 10 to 15 euros. And in Africa, between six and 22 euros, depending on the projects and their scope. So all this information should be processed and it is, it is easier to do that in a group than on individual farming, definitely. I hope that this helps actually to the audience to to assess the process. <laughs> yeah, you're sure. But I, as expected, there are questions which are coming up now from the participants and also from me. I can see them on the chat here. I, and I would be tempted to ask uh, you first and then of course go around. Um, so, so first question is that um, uh, which countries offer the best carbon markets? Now, I assume that the questionnaire wants to know that which country would offer the best price, right? Where the carbon can be sold uh, uh, most easily. Well, the best price that are obtained today are in France, in Germany, and in Northern European countries from what we see. And it can reach even 70 euros a ton in regenerative agriculture and uh, carbon removal. Um, if we speak about other solutions, hybrid and not nature-based solutions, if we speak about biochar, for example, on the platform says Pyro.Earth, which is a, um, a, a um, company and marketplace based in Finland, you can obtain even between 90 to 500 euros a ton with biochar solution. So, um, so they are largely bilateral trades, right? Or you find it on the exchange somewhere? I mean, how do you discover the price? That's the question. That, that's a very good question. So you have two types of markets. The first is organized one. So basically very led by EU ETS market um, with E, X and ICE. And, you, and also in, in US you have um, CME, so uh, Chicago Merchant Exchange with NGOs contracts which are very popular as well. Um, so the organized market is only reserved for the industrial groups, very highly polluting industrial groups, which have quotas, and they exchange these quotas on this market just between them mm -hmm. and the governments. So it is uh, something, it's a closed market. So individual participants can come and sell their credits there, for example. Mm -hmm. um, then you have a voluntary carbon market, which is the majority of companies today and buyers, um, including tech companies like Microsoft or Apple or any others, um, industrial groups, automobile groups, um, even oil industry groups are all in voluntary carbon markets today. And they are looking to offset their emissions and, as Devon said, basically scope three emissions of uh, GSG protocol which are huge. Today, for example, a group like Shell needs to offset around 120 million of tons per year until 2030, So, which is huge, right? So the challenge for the buyers is to have enough volume. So my advice to the sellers will be to have a high quality credits that they can sell at a higher price. 
And interesting because if you look at Shell, I'm sure the other oil companies also have similar obligations, right? Totally. Yeah. So I think, and we, we need to also find out about the Indian companies, obviously not in the same genre as Shell, but all the same big ones coming up. So explorations totally. we need to know. Okay. Interesting. Um, so Philip, I have a question uh, for you from uh, one of the participants is, um, and I think that's a, that's something which probably you can answer the best because you, you know India a bit, that what to what extent agricultural practices are required to change for carbon credits. Now, um, it, it, it can be a long, long answer as well, but uh, I'm sure you'll do crisp justice to it. Look, um, it can be a fairly short answer because Article 6 of the Paris 2015 Convention requires something called additionality, <clears throat> which means you actually have to undertake a new practice compared to what you're doing currently on the farm. Excuse me. And the problem with that is it doesn't reward the innovators who have already undertaken a new practice. So that's a real problem across the world. It's not just in India, this is a problem. It's a problem everywhere. So in Australia, we actually legislate what the, those new practices are. Mm -hmm. um, in the rest of the world, particularly in the voluntary market, you've got to demonstrate to the buyer that you've undertaken ad additionality and that without the carbon trading, that practice wouldn't have been done. So just because you haven't done it, um, but you were going to do it is not enough reason. You've got to generate. You've got to also demonstrate that the um, carbon trading made it possible to do. So that's that's the key thing. And, and as um, uh, Devon has, has pointed out, and um, Dr. Golnar is that um, much of those new practices are uh, based around regenerative agriculture or precision agriculture and how you look at them. Um, so they're uh, exceptionally in, important that those be considered. And, and particularly, it's it's ensuring vegetative cover over the ground, diversity of cropping varieties, um, aspects of it not disturbing the ground as much as possible, and moving away in a controlled manner, not completely abandoning, but moving away from the use of um, acid fertilizers and uh, herbicides and pesticides. You still use them but you use them in a, in a more controlled manner in association with the rotational system. Um, so the key thing is additionality, is to understand that what is the additional factor that you're going to undertake and to get the project registered before you undertake that additional factor. So you're allowed to trial to see if the additional factor will work, um, but you can't subject the whole farm to the additional factor before you've actually registered to begin. So that's really important internationally is to make sure that prior to beginning that, that you look into the opportunity in your local area to register a project through a variety of project providers. And as Devon indicated, um, that they can be called uh, aggregators and um, project developers. Um, they can be your local service providers, um, but it's very important that that be undertaken prior um, to undertake a new practice. So did I hear you correctly that Australia has a legislation around it to define additionality? Yes, they do. So we don't. In India, we don't still. Um, Australia is one of the few countries that is actually strongly defined that because we have such a large country with such a large soil types, it's actually very hard, as New Zealand's done, is, is to just model what, what practice would do, what increase in what soil type. So we haven't gone down, each country goes down a slightly different pathway. Um, the US is still grappling with which pathway that they will go down to. That there's, there's a lot of um, diverse uh, approaches in different states in the US. Um, but Australia has a, a system that is, is very tightly prescribed so that you, you end up with a, a precise manner of knowing that the carbon is a very, very high value. But because of that, it's it takes a while to introduce a new method. That's wonderful. I think there is, as you know, there's a there's an India, uh, Australia FTA, which is being now uh, discussed, signed. Maybe there should be one of the items there, if not already, that you know, Australia can assist India in developing this kind of a model, which is important. Yes. Why reinvent the wheel? We have to, we have to just, uh, you know, 
borrow it from the friends. That's the best to do. Um, so I think that's possible. Wonderful. Good to know. And is that something available in the net which I can also read or maybe something which you can pass out, pass on to me just for my the curious self? Um, as you know, that there is a Biotechnology Australia-India agreement um, and it's quite... Um, uh, it's quite possible with that um, bilateral agreements that that would also be including carbon. Um, I'm not so actively involved in it as it was, so I can't greatly comment. Um, but I know we have a, a, a agreement with the Pacific Islands to actually exchange carbon technology um, and allow exchange into Australia. So the Australian exchange does allow um, Pacific countries to trade their carbon as an ACU, which is Australian Carbon Credit Unit, into Australia. Um, we'll be seeing increasingly as um, Article 6 takes hold that countries on a one-to-one -one basis will allow trade as they understand the nature of each country's different systems. So um, as Dr. Golnar was talking about in regard to the fact that you deal with closed systems and voluntary exchanges on, on Vera or the equivalent, um, it, uh, countries are starting to set up bilateral um, trades between the closed countries, as long as the registries can be assured. Anyway, that's probably more her expertise than mine. <laughs> yeah, sure. So, I mean, I think Goldara wants to add something as well, and she's some experience, uh, I guess, in Africa. Please go ahead. Yes, I would like to, to add that effectively we have done some tests on regenerative agricultural practices and the best way that we saw to go for the farmers is to implement these agricultural regenerative practices maybe on one third of their lands first to test how the land will behave uh, during, uh, during one, two, three crop seasons and uh, then expand these methods to, 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 to other land. From our experience, what we saw is that definitely the result um, uh, on the profitability uh, of the farm it doubled actually for those who have implemented regenerative practices. So it's important to notice for those who wish to, to start doing that, I guess. Wonderful, anybody else to comment? Dr. Geza or uh, uh, Devon, anybody on this part? Maybe I just add a, a quick note to this from, from my past experience, especially with smallholder farmers in West Africa, Indonesia, but even in India. Um, if, if, you, if you try to engineer the farmers, but there is no communication, there is no sensitization, there is no farmer-centric approach. I've seen all these uh, Rajan ag and uh, agroforestry uh, inputs, these investments fail big time, and, and they even created adverse effects. Having a farmer-centric approach and, and having this dialogue with the farmers and implementing such practices like Golnara explained to you on, on partial of the farms, selecting the champion farmers, and this is also the carbon space has, has a specific point in, in, in our theory of change. We want to compare between the farms and we want to identify the champion farms based on their performance so that they can talk to other farmers. These are very good points, I think. Absolutely. I completely am with you because one thing, and I, I mentioned in my abbreviated, tech, this thing, EIM and education, education, education is very, very important. We just need to educate and take them on board. Absolutely. It can't be pushed through. Otherwise, it won't happen. So that's, that's uh, perfect. Um, I think the other thing which, uh, uh, you know, everyone uh, would want to know and, and uh, it was answered a little bit that which are the best markets. So you mentioned Golnara, you go to France and go to uh, Northern Europe and Finland. So obviously the, the higher you go north, I think you get better prices seems like Finland. So giving 90 odd euros, which is wonderful. Uh, so I think that's one. My question to you is, and all of you actually uh, around the table is that if there were to be one or two things, uh, which one is legislation, which Philip mentioned, what would you see the uh, government do uh, so that, you know, we in CII can also probably push through or take it up uh, to, to, to herald this or to usher this and really speaking, open up. I mean, not just talking about carbon and sequestration and GHG and reductions and carbon credits, but actually get this going. That's one thing. And the other thing is, of course, as we saw that cooperatives, uh, FPOs, clusters getting more uh, 
I would say, formalized and getting more, uh, uh, you know, empowered to deal with this kind of situation. So one for the government, one otherwise, uh, what would be your recommendations? What should we do to get this done faster, quicker? Otherwise, you know, all the uh, promises of net zero and all where agriculture would pay something like 20, 25% role is not going to happen. And, and it's a huge number of farmers here, huge. So obviously the problem is also mammoth. So having experience working with governments in Western Africa, what I have seen is that some have started by installing, installing government programs based on regenerative agriculture practices and food security mm -hmm. and not in starting from this no poverty food security then rather than speaking about carbon credits carbon credits is a nice to have i should say but we should start with the basis and the basis is how can we feed the population in 10 20 years from now and definitely the cooperation between governments and the population and technical persons on the ground is extremely important because this is, as Dr. Todd said, it's really important to, to ensure that there is an education. And education can happen when there is a big program, which is managed by the government on the ground, saying this is the program, it is financed, this is what you need to do. And, and speaking to populations this way, it's really helpful because in this case, you can scale your approach, not to one, two or three farmers, but to several groups of farmers at the same time. And, and, and this collaboration is extremely, extremely important. Mm -hmm. Then from the buyer's perspective, effectively, it's really important to know what are the SDGs that they wish to uh, also to to go for, you know, and, and I guess in the developing countries and huge countries like, like India, for example, the SDG goals can be huge, especially in regenerative agriculture. So my advice is, is invest all in, in these countries, um, which sometimes can, can be, or can be seen as risky, but this is where the most benefits we can see also for the populations and also for the companies working there. Okay, Devon, Philip, uh, Dr. Giza, any addition to this? Um, look, I, I completely support what's just been stated. Um, the, the issue of education um, is huge. The other issue is that farmers around the world, doesn't matter if it's India or Australia, are very nervous about change. And you change from one financial model to another. In Australia, it's called crossing the valley of death. Um, and so to cross from traditional practice to regenerative practice comes with um, a potential perception that you might have a loss in yield during that period and lose your income. So the government has a role to play there where it could be short-term subsidies that could be picked up later in Very tax. Good idea. Um, so the issue of financing the change is essential. And I do pick up that for many farmers, um, the increased profit is the driver um, and the diversity of income is the driver more than um, the aspect of the carbon alone. So crossing the valley of death and the education to get there's one thing, but without support, and a bit of hand-holding and reassurance that you don't die as you cross the valley of death is uh, can be provided um, by the Department of Ag Extension Officers, the, the, the FU uh, science coordinators, um, and potentially with some subsidies or private green financing, which is what's starting to occur in, in Australia. Great idea. Great. Devon, yourself, anything? Yeah, it, this, this is great. I've never been asked the if I had a magic wand question. <laughs> um, but I think I would like to see more investment by governments into kind of the market infrastructure for offset projects. So that this can take many forms, but the one that I see a real need for is in the form of, of protocols and, and methodologies. I think there's been a real trend towards these kind of all-encompassing protocols or universal protocols, which is which is great in some respects, but there's also 
it's an inbuilt conservatism that um, that does drive costs up. I think governments can, you know, invest in protocols that make sense for their industries in their region and the practices that make sense for their farmers um, in collaboration. You know, it, it's important to work within the confines of government, but also bring in the technology providers who are on the edge of this space, because those those sorts of like cross-functional partnerships is how this this whole sector is going to start really operating at scale. All right. So good. I think we come to the end of this session. I can see Vitoja on the screen, which is a good reminder that, hey, guys, you stop. So thank you very much. But let me thank you, first of all, before, before she takes over. Uh, been a pleasure really being with you. I, I hope that we have another one quite soon. Uh, and very good uh, uh, thought process from all of you. I guess CIA also will have some work to do now to make this into some kind of recommendatory paper. And, and let's Let's, uh, Jane and Roli, I think we should get going and talk to the government on these, these aspects. It's, it's a very difficult subject, not easy subject, really speaking. But I, you know, I am one who's always more like keen to do some, see some implementation on the ground. That's important. So let's get this going. So thank you all. Ritoja, over to you. Uh, thank you, panelists, for a very informative session. I would also like to thank our partners, ITC, PI and Industries, Mahindra, Taffy, Ulam, and Koteva. I express our sincere gratitude to the Ministry of Agriculture and Farmers Welfare for their support. As part of the B20 Secretariat, we will continue on the dialogue on Ag Tech throughout this year with physical meets, and we look forward to meeting all of you face to face for the same. Thank you very much once again. Uh, we will now be beginning our next session on blockchain, which uh, begins at 5 30 uh, Indian Standard Time. Look forward to seeing you there. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Thank you again. Bye-bye. Thank you.